It's a real pleasure to be here today. I like to let you know that everything in the U.S. is just fine. I hear there's um, some political stuff going on in the U.K. at the moment. Um, I, I have some sympathy with a little bit of a crazy political process right now. Um, and so I, I, I hope we can take this moment, instead of worrying about the, the craziness that is politics, to instead think about the positivity and joy that's going to come to us in the future. And I get to talk today about things that make me very excited and very happy, the way that the world is going to work and how we all get to be part of it. So I'm Tara. I am uh, I'm a hacker. Um, I told that to the UK Border Patrol on the way in. <laughs> I, I hand over my passport and they say, hi, who you work for? I said, Symantec. And they said, what do you do there? I said, I'm a hacker. And they said, and then where will you be staying? Wait, what? <laughs> I said, I'm a hacker. And they said, then three guys come over and they both just sit down on the desk and go, and what's that like? <laughs> Border Patrol. They were so friendly and lovely. I'm sure everyone here has the exact same experience with them that I did. Uh, yeah, I'm Tara. And... Um, I spend my time thinking about the future and who's going to be building it. Uh, this is a gift from my fiance. It was one of the reasons why he's my fiance. Uh, there's a, a great com uh, comic strip artist out there who likes to do, to do hackers as superheroes, which is a far sight from the way we are often portrayed in the media. And so looking at a picture like this, I get to, to live up to something. And it's a wonderful experience to see that. I grew up on a little farm in Silverton, Oregon. That is the northwest of the United States. I raised horses there, and I will tell you right now, for those of you, is anyone grown up on a farm at all in here? Just a couple of people? Not a single farm kid in this entire, oh, we've got a farm kid or two, wonderful. Farm kids and hackers have an awful lot in common. Uh, there's nothing that you can't do with bailing twine and a pretty good <laughs> attitude, right? So that's kind of where I started getting my my idea of how to fix things as fast as possible, and if something works, then it works. Don't get too picky. Um, I started at that point playing around a little bit with computers. Uh, I, I think I began with a remote control that I never quite got reassembled the same way again when I was about six, but my dad was still really encouraging about it. It was a wonderful experience to grow up that way. I. Uh, I loved growing up on that farm, and I loved playing with computers, but at the same time, not everything can last forever. And I ended up in Portland, Oregon, uh, beginning to start a bit of a weird career as a high school dropout and a little bit of a troublemaker. It's where I got some of the attitude I, I still retain, hopefully. I took off and out of high school just went straight to community college, and then sort of went all the way through. I spent a lot of time in academia. I did some time in a master's degree and then a PhD at University of Michigan in essentially the study of applied warfare is a good way to put it. I learned a lot of math then and I wrote a lot of Java, which is how I got most of my computational skills. And uh, interestingly enough, they want you to pay money to stick around in school in the US, a little unfortunately. So around the time when I couldn't finish the rest of my PhD, uh, I managed to get a couple of interviews in a lovely place called Redmond, Washington. Now interestingly enough, um, I had spent all that time doing applied warfare, game theory. Fortunately, the company that I interviewed with didn't really know the difference between game theory and game design. So I talked my way into a job on the Halo team. Uh, yeah, I, I every once in a while remember what it was like before I was engaged. I, I used to date and go to the bars with my girlfriends. Uh, whenever we would, we would tell people what we did for a living, I have a girl stick up her hand and say, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm a veterinarian, and I would say, I'm a developer on the Halo team. It was like the culling of the gazelles. You shoved aside, guys coming over, and they weren't asking for my number, they were asking what it was like to fist bump Master Chief every day walking into work. <laughs> it was cool, bro. <laughs> and uh, spending that time, I learned a little bit more about how the bigger companies work. I spent some time doing a lot of high tech, high paying, short term jobs, and I did a lot of interviewing and a lot of contracting in the Seattle, Washington area. Unlike a lot of women, I think, I spent a lot of time interviewing and learning what does and doesn't work well for women when they interview for highly technical jobs. I learned that I had to be very brash and very forthright, and the words, I am the most badass web developer in Seattle, came out of my mouth more than once. 
it didn't hurt that I had figured out some SEO at that point. And so once you looked up web developer in Seattle, I popped at the top in a Google search. That's the way to do a resume, I think. I learned a lot about it, about how to have that attitude. And spending that time, I learned some lessons that I thought would help a lot of other women, which is how this happened. I wrote the book called Women in Technology after a Kickstarter that taught me that a lot of people wanted information about what it was like to be a woman in technology. It was a really wonderful and inspiring experience. Um, but I still do what I do. I, I run around, I hack things. Now I hack things for Symantec on purpose. And I cook a lot. I like cooking salmon in the in kitchens all over the world. I figured out a way to do this with a sous vide cooker in hotel rooms, and that's an entirely different story. It's a little odd to walk down the rooms in a, in a hotel and smell perfectly poached salmon coming from someone's room and have it actually be perfectly poached salmon. I've been in some sketchy hotels as a hacker. And I still do hack things, spend some time on my computer. I, uh, I have now stepped into the world of, the infer of, of bioinformatics and biohacking, and now I am a cyborg. I have a low-frequency RFID chip in this hand and a high-frequency or near-field chip, uh, near-field communication chip in this hand. This one right here is actually my Symantec door badge. No, they didn't make me do that. <laughs> in fact, I actually freaked the hell out of the director of global security the first time I did this in front of him. He's like, what the hell is going on? Pulls out a phone that has teeth on it, right? <laughs> What's going on here? Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting experience being in this world of experimentation and that is full of joy and creativity. And it's given me a perspective on the world that is one where I've realized that we combine science with the art and the dance of understanding humanity. I love Argentine <laughs> tango. I love cooking and being. Um, my fiance is a physical penetration tester, a physical penetration specialist, so he breaks into buildings for a living. Try explaining physical penetration specialist to your dad. That's your fiance's <laughs> occupation. That was a fun. That was a fun moment. Actually, Dad was super cool about it. He was like, "Oh, does he play poker?" I was like, "Yes." I told Mom that uh, my fiance was the director of a little education startup. It was fun. <laughs> Didn't want to explain it as much to Mom. <laughs> now what do I do? Caffeine all day long, every chance I get. I drink tea, and I think, and I think about things like who it is that's creating the future that we want to live in. I think you already know that you're the people in this room who are doing that, right? So let me start talking right now about what you and I and this world do about two very American things. Fast cars and big stacks of money. They don't look like they used to anymore, right? Big cars and big money aren't really cars we control and money we can hold any longer. The world's made up of little ones and zeros, right? So let's talk today about what it means to be involved in this community in the upcoming issues of the Internet of Things and data transactions that can be worth more than money ever could possibly be worth and how we interact with them. Who's making the security in the Internet of Things? In cars, in dolls, probably in this projector. When I'm, we could make this talk very different than I think if I have the right of it about where this projector comes from and what we could be doing with it. The way that we think about security in the Internet of Things is deeply problematic. And the reason why is probably very few of us are involved in actually making something that has crap Wi-Fi connections in it that is distributed to small children around the world. People that do are incentivized to create something that is as inexpensive as possible, and parents are incentivized to purchase something, like the recent doll issue from China, that are as fun and as desirable to children as possible. And when the Mirai botnet takes over a web of children's toys and refrigerators and, sure, toasters, even though we talk about toasters constantly, are either the manufacturers or the parents incentivized to do anything about it? Are they harmed by it? Not remotely. So where does the security in the Internet of Things come from? And who has the responsibility for creating it? It's becoming faster and easier every single day for people to spin up a simple Kickstarter. I would know. I've done six of them at this point. 
and create a small device that is desirable to a lot of people with security in it, if I'm not being harmed by the lack of security in any device in particular, how am I the one who's incentivized to fix it? The answer really is, I'm not. The way we start thinking about Internet of Things is the same sort of way that we need to start thinking about financial security. Who's incentivized between a buyer and a seller to ensure that the metadata of that transaction is not retained and is not processed either individually or in the aggregate to provide information about someone's spending habits? Most people don't even understand that you don't have to have a loyalty card at a grocery store to be tracked for your buying, right? They're just tracking you through your debit card. It's a bit of a false flag operation to be offered a loyalty card for just about anything and then find out later on that you're being tracked anyway, you're just not really getting any credit for it, right? Mm -hmm. It's an opt-out, not an opt-in system, and the only way to opt-out is physically using cash. Unfortunately, we can't really do that anymore, right? We like to think of the way that we get money around the world as the possibility for frictionless globalization, the possibility you can pick up your phone right now and send something to M-Pesa in Kenya, right? send a, a remittance to a family member in Kenya. And yet, at the same time, that piece of information that you were someone who sent money across borders is more valuable than the actual amount of the transaction to someone building a profile of your habits. How many folks in this room are involved in the financial industry? Financial and cybersecurity? This is where ethics matter a profound amount about what you do and do not collect in terms of the people who are affected by the profiles that are created on them. We all understand that algorithms are beginning to run the world, and they're starting to select who is and isn't treated well at the same time that they help companies make money. Do you know who was responsible for the United passenger being dragged off of the plane on the 8th? Every single person pointed back to a computer and said the algorithm told me to do it. What does that say in terms of the ethics of the people that are creating that algorithm and the responsibility on a human level to override computer logic to make sure that people are treated well? And how many people in this room have control or input into algorithms that determine whether or not people are treated well in the financial industry? Please think deeply about your responsibility and the ethics that you personally, internally have to hold in order to make sure that human beings are treated to the best of your capacity like humans with dignity and rights. Transactions are information, right? They are communication. We talk every time we pull out our wallet. We talk every single time we use PayPal and PISA, Venmo, Square Cash. That information is being collected somewhere. Square Cash is a popular application in the United States that lets you send money anywhere. And it's free. Except, I think we all know that when something's free, it means you're the product, not the client, right? The people that are collecting this information, some of whom are in this room, have a responsibility to their companies and to the people that they are serving and protecting and their customers to do the right thing at every possible opportunity. Data is becoming more valuable than gold. So, if data is becoming more valuable than gold, who's securing it? Fort Knox is the place we secure gold in the United States. Still a lot of it. But what's the Fort Knox of data? Who's the location, where is the place where people are thinking about storing data that can be broken into, can't be secured properly, and might be the kind of place where you could get information on someone that could harm them for a lifetime? The answer, very unfortunately, is that it doesn't exist. The people in this room collect and contain and use the data that is, that is broadcast, analyzed, and sold. And as long as the people in this room have a spirit of ethical responsibility towards that data. We are in a better situation as an industry, as cybersecurity professionals, people whose job it is to uphold the honor of this profession. Some of us wear suits, some of us wear hoodies. But all of us are understanding that there is a major disruption coming in the way that the world works, in the way that the big cars might or might not have the proper amount of security in them, in the way that the stacks of cash are beginning to disappear into a digital frontier. I was at a conference called Financial Cryptography a week and a half ago where we talked about blockchain and, the blo uh, and, and Bitcoin. The way that we are starting to break down national barriers is starting to change the way national and international economics works, right? 
How many folks in here, and I'm glad to see there's a lot of people from the financial industry, have ever heard of something called the Mundell Fleming theory? All right, the unholy trinity. The three things that let a, com a country determine whether or not its currency is going to be priced well, its interests is going to be valuable, and whether or not its fiscal controls are able to be applied effectively is called the Mundell Fleming theory. It says that as a country, you can control two out of three things, but must let the third go, go loose. Monetary controls, monetary flows, that's capital exchanges, right? Interest rates, the price of money, and fiscal policy, how you tax and how you spend internally inside a country, right? The United States tends to control its interest rates and its fiscal policy. Same thing happens in Britain, right? So interestingly enough, the Mundell Fleming theory says that we were in a world with physical currency that couldn't be escaped from until we started creating something like Bitcoin that let people ex escape entirely from the realm and the bounds of international economics. People are opting out of the kind of system that locks them into a nation's border for their currency choices. And that should be both terrifying and thrilling on so many levels. It's an opportunity for people at every specter of society to have information and to transfer value around the world. And yet, that's the kind of thing that really scares any Federal Reserve Board, correct? Any monetary authority in any country gets a little bit nervous when they find out that people can opt out of the monetary system. The information that's collected when people opt out of the monetary system, however, can be more valuable than gold as well. As we think about the way that Bitcoin works, and we recognize that this, just last night, was the value of an economy that's worth an unbelievable amount of money, millions of dollars, billions of dollars, that people have opted out of the international economic system to join this system instead. It should tell us that we are in a world where people do not believe that the current system is frictionless. It's not frictionless, and the people in this room, whenever that friction is created, get to collect that data and get to treat it as responsibly as you are capable of doing in that moment. One of the main reasons why I care about this field so very deeply is because cybersecurity, because information security, is the thing that stops people from being as har harmed as deeply as they might possibly be harmed by the world in which we are on an everyday basis being disrupted. Disrupting these kinds of international markets means disrupting people, right? Now, when I'm in the United States, I like to warn everybody that I'm a bit of an Anglophile. And when I talk about disruption in international economics, I often talk about a world that I liked to explore when I was watching Downton Abbey. Right? Uh, you'll often get a, a lot of laughs at this moment in front of an American audience because so many people are deeply addicted to it. How many of you have seen the entire series of Downton Abbey? And raise your hands, I don't care who you are, come on, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Everyone loves to watch this and to give great examples of international economic disruption. And the reason why I like to talk about it, and there are going to be some spoilers here, just so, just so you know, you can feel free to cover your eyes and plug your ears at this point. The reason why I talk about this is because the kind of transition that was happening from 1912 to 1928 in the world of transportation is the same kind of transportational shift that's happening right now. You might all remember Lady Mary marrying Henry Talbot. I warned you there were spoilers, right? And remember, Henry Talbot did something at the time which was completely revolutionary. As a young aristocrat, he opened a mechanics shop, right, to service this brand new fascinating technology called cars, called automobiles. This is the kind of thing that an aristocrat could do and expect to make a good living doing at the time, right? Who was he replacing? The workday, everyday taxi driver at the time, right? I'm getting you're going to get where I'm going with this analogy. Now, the world of horses is limited, usually, to the very, very wealthy. They call it the sport of kings now for a reason, because, frankly, those are the only people that could afford to run and maintain a stable of horses. And the world where horses used to be everyday transportation has simply gone. Although I do love the hats that are involved with the, with the profession. So what is the world that we're walking into with the way our transportation is beginning to go. I know we all understand self-driving cars are coming, right? 
we've seen an entire industry of taxi cabs get disrupted by Uber, by the ride-sharing economy, right? Now, self-driving cars are coming, which are going to put another, how many, two million people out of work? And once we end up in that future, it's going to become less and less accurate with self-driving cars that can be dispatched at a moment's notice, that are run in batches at a time, to think of them as fleets of cars. Instead, it's going to start to become more accurate to think of them as herds of cars. The American long-haul trucking industry is being disrupted at the exact same time as cars drive themselves. The transport industry is functionally going away. And as we think about the responsibility of people who are involved in the securing of automobiles, what we're going to be thinking about isn't necessarily those herds of cars, but perhaps the first person who ever disrupts a local area network and 20 trucks on the American plains and rustles their first herd of Mack trucks. Right? That's the kind of challenge that's coming for us as cybersecurity experts. How do you stop people? who become land pirates, truck rustlers, right? I mean, we can't really take them out back and hang them anymore, although I mean, there are some of us that are still enthused about that idea. In this, uh, in this world, these are the kinds of challenges that we have coming in front of us. How many of you have worked on the Internet of Things and cars? Awesome, I'm glad to hear it. The ethical challenges of working in this world are profound. How do you teach a car the difference between a squirrel and a kitten in front of you, and which you would personally choose to not run over? I mean, I'm not saying squirrels are evil or anything like that, but I'm probably going to opt for the kitten over the squirrel, right? But how do you teach a car that? And those are the kinds of ethical decisions that you every day, sometimes without knowing it or without thinking about it, are coding into the kind of algorithms that make decisions for people in the future. <laughs> and unfortunately, those algorithms can be broken. These are a couple of friends of mine. Um, I, I, will, I will call them acquaintances. I don't know that I would pretend to be friends. They are some profoundly respected hackers in the American security community. One of them, Mark Rogers, is one of your own. He's British. He's a, just an incredible gentleman. He introduced me to one of my co-authors in the Women in Tech book. He broke Tesla. Showed up at uh, DEF CON 23 a couple of years ago and explained how you could break into a Tesla and remote control it via the entertainment system. In one of the better examples of how to deal with a security breach, the CTO of Tesla showed up on the spot, handed them both the bug bounty check on stage, and did a shot with them. I respect that. <laughs> yeah, you also have to kind of understand DEF CON a little bit, too. It's definitely a shots on stage kind of place. Understanding that the entertainment system was a pathway through which a Tesla could be hacked, that your car could be taken over remotely, was a wake-up call for the American media. Right? It was a wake-up call for the media around the world to understand that the people in this industry are the ones making decisions that either leave cars, the most common, everyday thing we could possibly imagine, open to that kind of a hack, that kind of a vulnerability, or secure them properly. Our actions have a profound amount of human consequences, the kind of consequences that involve not just a, a, an, an imaginative and imaginary choice, between a squirrel and a kitten on the road, but between a pedestrian, a single pedestrian on the road, and hitting a bus full of 20 school children. The school kids are probably going to survive, right? In the choice that a car has to make without your input between whether or not to certainly kill one person and possibly harm 20 others, how does the car make that decision? We are the people making those decisions. In information security, we are the ones making sure that the future is safer than it could otherwise have been. Sometimes that involves cold decisions, but that's why we have ethics to think about these things in advance. <coughs> Our industry is growing up, right? The folks in this room are wearing a lot of suits. Sometimes I talk to people in suits. Sometimes I talk to people in hoodies. Sometimes I talk to people in bunny suits. It was a really fun con. <laughs> But every single person I talk to is part of an industry that's making sure that my mother's credit card is safe right now. And that the car that my father is going to be in in five years that he's not touching the wheel on is safe from the influences of a malicious hacker. Note that I say malicious hacker. And the reason I do that is because the mindset of hacking is an extremely important one for the future. It's a, 
It's a way of figuring out unintended consequences by liking to break things. I like to break things. Most of the time I can even fix them. Still haven't ever fixed that original remote control. I should probably put it in a glass case and keep it dust free and every once in a while I'll pull it back out and give it a shot again. The reason that we think this way, the reason that we have to start thinking about unintended consequences, the way that we process information is being translated into those ones and zeros and it is turning into the way that the world interacts with stuff, with people, makes choices without us even knowing. The people who pulled that passenger off that United flight did so because a computer told them to do so. That is one of the most terrifying things I've ever heard in my entire life. The computer told me to do it, and no one overrode, in that moment, a decision to hurt someone. <coughs> it tells us that while people are well-meaning, they like to bow to authority. Don't always bow to authority. Sometimes, break things. Sometimes, think about the way the world is supposed to work and the way that it should work instead of the way that it does work. Don't be a rock star. I'm not a big fan of people who disclose vulnerabilities in the information security community without properly giving notice and using responsible disclosure. Twitter is not a vulnerability disclosure tool. All right? How many of you that work at a bank right now want to have a famous bug bounty researcher or bu uh, uh, hacker just say, hey, somebody from this institution give me a call on Twitter. Raise your hand if you think that sounds like a fun idea. I don't know about you, but that leads to a lot of panicked internal phone calls. And it often leads to a mobilization of the PR properties and systems inside a company instead of the vulnerability repair systems inside a company first. Because we're human beings, right? We're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to save ourselves and save the people that's, that we serve. And humans are imperfect. The only thing we can all do is nudge properly, constantly, in the direction of right and ethical behavior. Rock stars don't do that. We create constantly. We create because we are bound to create, because we are, we are driven to create, and we create because we can't not. I make things and I build things because I can't not. I can't see a pile of scraps without trying to turn it into a house. I can't see a building without wondering whether or not there's more than one exit and whether or not I can get around the back way. I think the people in this room are the same kind of people. Do you like breaking things and making things? I don't care if it's with popsicle sticks. But do you feel that joy when you get the opportunity on a weekend to build something, maybe with your kids, a fence, a birdhouse, a computer, to take apart a laptop and find out what makes it tick on the inside? If you feel that joy, if you feel that responsibility towards other people, that is the kind of person I want in this industry. The kind of person who has that deep and abiding sense of ethics. The kind of person I want thinking about the kind of choices that my father's car is going to be making when I'm not there to help him, right? Do you feel that responsibility? Good, because I'm seeing the nodding heads that tell me that this is not an American issue, it's not a British issue, it's not an EU issue, it's not an African issue, it's not an Asian issue. This is an issue that has absolutely no borders whatsoever. Every single person in this world is affected by the choices we all make when we create applications that are secure or insecure, and that's why it matters to us on an everyday basis to build ethics into the choices that we make as information security specialists, as people who have responsibilities to disclose and protect information at the level at which it is, respect is respectable and responsible for the companies that we work for and the people we serve and we protect. Right? When I think about those stacks of money and the cybersecurity experts who built Bitcoin, when I think about the kind of people that I know are busy demonstrating how you can break into a car so that you can keep it safe in the future, I think about the kind of people who are building a future I want to live in. I hope deeply, and now I've got a pretty good sense of it, that it's true, that the people in this room are part of that community are part of the people that desperately want, madly want to keep people safe, right? To serve them, to be part of a community that treats people the right way. Our industry is growing up. It's no longer just a couple of kids in basements anymore. And we're not quite at the point yet where the people in this room are still rebels a little bit, right? That's good. Because we are the ones who are making those decisions. 
we are at the forefront, at the frontier of a world where human beings make the computers, but the computers make those split-second decisions. Let's train them up the right way, right? Turn them into a well-tended garden instead of a mad forest full of strangeness. On the other hand, sometimes there's a little craziness that's always needed. The misfits and the people that ended up in this frontier were the ones making the future. I am glad to see it. And I'm glad to be part of you and to shake hands and to answer any questions you're going to have. I'm going to grab some questions here in just a second, but I'm so glad to be part of you.